I cannot possibly do this topic justice in 45 minutes. Um, it's a topic that takes much of our time internally, much of our external time in conversations with the people in this room. So um, any particular areas that I talk about that you would like to grill us further on or you'd like more information on, then grab either me or anybody in my team afterwards. So what am I going to talk about? The changing landscape. I think Simon set the scene very, very beautifully here. You will be delighted to hear I am not going to talk about media fragmentation. We've all heard a lot about it. We all know that that's the case. Um, most importantly, what does this mean for the people in this room? So whether you're technology marketeers or agencies, um, it is very, very challenging. The different world that we're now living in, that digital has enabled us in many, many areas to make things easier, equally has made it all a bit complicated. I'm going to walk through one example today. We have umpteen others. Um, and then I'm going to touch very, very briefly on some of the free help that's available from Google. So, we at Google do lots and lots of philanthropic work um, with people like Nokia and others. But to what degree is this really having an impact? And certainly for you as marketeers. On the bizarre off chance that you're not feeling sufficiently awake and invigorated after Rito's session, any idea as to the answer to this question? And nobody in my team is allowed to shout out. Any ideas, percentage-wise, of time spent online now versus engaging with other media? Online, overall. It's actually, to my mind, this is a really good example of people's definition of online. And my own personal belief is that people deem online to be everything that, that doesn't actually include work time. The figure is 30%. Not surprisingly, um, if you break that down, a large percentage of it centers around content, information gathering, researching product. A very large percentage as well, as you can see, is centered around communication. That shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody in this room. Commerce, community, and search. Um, I have to say, this particular fact somewhat horrified me at the number of people in the UK that are clearly having TV dinners extraordinaire. Um, suffice to say, it really reiterates the fact that online is incredibly important, and we've all done it. So many an evening, we all sit there with our laptops, in my case, as soon as my kids are in bed, doing my emails, not work emails usually, um, booking holidays, etc. And what we see in terms of search terms is that there is an immediate correlation here. So for anybody watching a TV ad, there is a direct and immediate huge spike in search terms around whatever has been advertised. So a very, very integrated relationship here. <coughs> Hopefully not too, too many more TV dinners of the future there. Any ideas as to what the answer to this might be? How many searches now via Google per month in the UK? And again, my team keeps them. Any ideas? Any other ideas? <laughs> the Vodafone guy should know the answer to this. It is, in fact, four billion. So there are an awful lot of people spending an awful lot of time online. Equally, within that time, a phenomenal number, as you can see here, searching for potentially your product. I think one of the critical things worth noting here is it's all well and good people spending time online, but actually everybody in this room ultimately is charged with it having a positive impact on sales. So is that the case here in the UK? Well, yes it is. This always um, staggers me because here in the UK we have 20% of the population of the US, yet we have 60% of the e-commerce spend. So actually, we we're a very, very mature market in terms of people physically buying product. 
in the online environment. So digital is increasingly important across every area of the purchase funnel. And it's not just a B2C phenomenon. So we have many, many conversations with customer organizations <coughs> and agencies around the fact that, yeah, but isn't it all led by the consumer? We spend a lot of time speaking generally about consumers and changing consumer behavior. What we've seen increasingly, and I would argue most over the last, most significantly over the last couple of years, is this phenomenon is absolutely also being played out within the B2B environment. Now, inevitably, the length of purchase cycle, the net worth of the overall product, service, solution, will determine the degree to which that is played out within the online environment, i.e., inevitably, enormous IT contracts are not physically going to be bought online. However, the majority of time researching them is. And search is often used as the first port of call in that B2B technology decision-making process. So a very different world to where we were a few years ago, when I think in the SME market, for example, we saw a lot of face-to-face -face interactions going on. There were a lot of conversations, either peer-to-peer -peer conversations or conversations between an SME and their channel partners where they were very, very reliant on personal recommendations, listening to people for recommendations as to whether supplier X was better than supplier Y, what was their customer service like, and so on. All of that information, as we're all aware, is now available immediately, real time, within the online environment. So it's having an impact. It used to be much, much easier. So as part of my degree, some years ago, um, I studied marketing. And put very simplistically, it was that easy. Who are we trying to target? What does their profile look like? What age are they? What are they interested in? What are their hobbies? What do they spend their time doing? So that was the who bit covered off. What? What are we going to offer them? Well, inevitably, the key difference here is in customer retention. What do we do with existing customers to maintain our market share? Is it all around upsell, cross-sell, ensuring that every engagement with them, irrespective of Marcom's vehicle, is relevant and timely? With potential customers, what will we offer them? Do we need to entice them with additional services, additional discount models, pricing, and so on? And then the how. Everybody in this room is charged with spending an awful lot of time on the how. How are we actually going to speak to them? So it used to be much, much easier. I was clearly having an ugly day that day. Um, digital is making it much, much, much more complicated. So not only is there the challenge of marketeers and agencies having to learn <coughs> new marketing language, recruit different skills, engage with different levels of internal and expert and external expertise. It also raises a huge question mark over organizational structure. So one of the questions that, that Simon was asked was around the ownership piece. Is that a marketing initiative? Is it a business initiative? And I think what we're seeing now is a huge, huge blurring, which is very, very challenging, not just for marketeers, but for organizations in their entirety in answering the question of who's accountable for this stuff. So I think this year, within both the telecoms and the more classic technology sector, what we have seen is some very, very bullish PR <laughs> and some very, very public figures quoting, digital is at the core of our business. Digital's at the core of every single thing we do. But it's a long journey, and in our experience, there are very few organizations that have it absolutely nailed in terms of the accountability piece, the measurement piece, and in terms of interacting externally with customers and partner organizations. So it's all very, very complex. But what, do this, what does this mean for you guys here in the room? Um, I'm going to share a 
tiny insight with you into the consumer electronics specific research that we've just carried out. Um, tiny insight because we don't have, have sufficient time today to go through it in detail. So do follow up with me or any of the guys in my team afterwards to, to see it in its entirety. Um, we basically looked at the importance of digital throughout the tech purchase. And I think this, this raises some interesting questions. So we looked at breaking customers that we asked into three different distinct groups. So the who piece. And those distinct, distinct groups were those that carried out their purchase process online in its entirety. So from the beginning of research right the way through the purchase funnel, if we pretend for a nanosecond that the purchase funnel is linear, if only. Um, we then also looked at what we call ROPO internally. So those that researched online but purchased offline. And inevitably, one of the many, many challenges for the people in this room is this piece. How on earth do you measure it? <coughs> so either for OEMs who aren't necessarily e-commerce enabled, sell through other channels, or indeed for any organization where you have a presence in retail, whether it's your own stores or the partners I've referenced. Suffice to say, though, in terms of the level of digital importance, it was absolutely critical, as you would expect, so a good sanity check for us all, in every single stage of those that carried out the process purely within the digital environment. One thing worth mentioning here, by the way, is the third piece that we looked at, which I'm not going to talk about today, but inevitably we have reams of data on, are those that purely carried out the purchase process for tech products offline. And I think one of the questions for us to collectively ask ourselves is to what degree is it worth investing in those offline only purchases? Because the demographics would indicate that the majority of that audience are 50 plus. And the question, therefore, for all of us is, OK, to what degree do we genuinely believe that our investment and, therefore, the level of ROI will pay off to convert people who traditionally, for some time now, have taken the advice of somebody in a retail store? So going back to that, not necessarily that peer-to-peer, -peer, but very, very much the face-to-face -face interaction. The million dollar question. So this may give some of you the ammunition you require. <coughs> OEM websites are critical. So we've spent quite a lot of time at Google looking at website usability. How easy is it for people, once they're on your site, to find relevant product, to package together what they would like to buy, and where your e-commerce enabled to physically go through the purchase process. If not, inevitably, to have absolute clarity of navigation as to which of your partners they can buy product from. And we've had some interesting conversations around it. I think the interesting thing for me about the research findings was the degree to which manufacturer sites are absolutely critical in the tech purchase process. So they are used for all the things you can see there, people looking for additional details around products that they may have already identified they want to buy, so looking at the specs. Equally, fantastic upsell opportunity. So if we look there, wanting to actually have a look at all the different models produced by the same brand. There is a pretty high percentage, so 53%, that believe the manufacturer's websites pr provide the most accurate information product. And I think this is the first time in any of our research that we've done where this has come out so very, very strongly. So critical to ensure that that clarity of navigation and the ease of use, a la Apple, as Simon referenced earlier, is absolutely where it should be. And the issue that we, we spend quite a lot of time talking about here is also highlighted. So often a lack of discoverability, i.e., your customers are looking online 
all the time for your products. And if you're not there, there is, of course, the opportunity for them to go immediately to, to any of your competitors, as we know. What about brand specifically, though? So brand plays a, an enormously important role still in this process for tech purchases. Four out of the top six highlighted here centered around brand. So I like the brand. I've had this brand before. Best quality brand for this product. Have other products by this brand. So the role of technology brands is absolutely critical in ensuring that not only are you continuing to engage with existing cu customers, you're also able to capture new ones. However, what about the percentage that haven't necessarily made their minds up? Can you potentially conv convince them to jump ship and join you if they're currently buying from a competitor? So approximately a third of the panel that we surveyed, which was over 4,000 customers, haven't made their minds up about a brand. So there is definitely a phenomenal number of people within the online environment who aren't 100% sure about the brand that they're going to buy, therefore an enormous opportunity assuming you have the right message at the right time, etc., to capture them. And just so that you're aware, the products listed across the bottom are the different, products area, different product areas that we were specifically looking at. So laptops, netbooks, digital cameras, video cameras, and TVs. So how do you do it? We're in a really, really scary place now. If you think about everything that we've discussed this morning so far, it's a massive leap of faith to go from being completely in control of your brand to actually the scenario we're in currently whereby anybody can talk about your brand very publicly, immediately, and share that with billions of people. So it's a pretty scary place to be. Simon mentioned this very briefly. So conversation mark conversational marketing, what on earth do we mean by that? YouTube is a very, very good example of this, um, where what we're talking about is brands speaking with their customers, customers speaking with their friends, peers, partners, sharing very, very publicly within the online environment. And a very good example now of a different Marcoms vehicle that is being used to reflect exactly how people are behaving right now. I think one, one thing worth mentioning, Matt touched on the fact that we now have 20 hours of video uploaded every minute on YouTube globally. 20 hours. And we've come a very, very, very long way from the days of cats on skateboards, chuckling children, people filming their mates <coughs> crashing on a ski slope, all that kind of user-generated content is absolutely still there, of course. And it was very, very much the behavior that caused the huge increase in attaining the kind, of, the kind of levels that we're looking at now. I think the fundamental difference with YouTube now is the fact that we have engaged in many, many more B2B partnerships. So a lot more of the content is professional content that's up there. Um, few examples of how YouTube is being used. It's being used very, very successfully now um, to publicly share the information, the speeches, the videos made at key, key political events. So I think we are all anticipating an increase in Gordon Brown, David Cameron et al. Um, investing a lot more time in very publicly using YouTube channels, as they are already, by the way, to share their message with the masses. So Davos is a very good and very public example of that. One of the other examples that I think is a lovely one of showing how these new Marcoms vehicles and community platforms can really bring together people from totally different walks of life, totally different geographies, some shared, some non-shared interests. We launched um, earlier this year, something called YouTube Symphony Orchestra. 
and we had a very, very famous conductor trying to enlist the help of musicians from around the world. Professional, amateur, semi-professional. With a view to ultimately performing a live concert that of course was filmed and subsequently put on YouTube at Carnegie Hall in New York. So for a 10 year old violinist in Singapore, an opportunity like this is absolutely phenomenal. And YouTube was used as the main vehicle for recruiting members of the orchestra. And they had an amazing concert that was indeed played live at Carnegie Hall with a combination of people that had been recruited via YouTube to form this totally new orchestra. Now, without YouTube, none of those people would ever have met, almost guaranteed. So they had their, their moment of fame, both live at a very, very famous um, and esteemed venue, and also on YouTube for everybody to see. And it's being used a lot. I've already referenced the, um, the, the B2B professional content. We're, doing, we're seeing an awful lot more um, long-form content that we are increasingly monetizing. Um, so we will undoubtedly continue to have conversations with you around how these types of Marcoms vehicles can be used specifically within the tech sector. So we kind of need to look at all tech marketing very, very differently indeed. For any of you that were at our marketing summit in the summer, um, you will have heard Richard Eyre, the chairman of the IAB, speaking about how we all need to put a digital lens on our view of marketing, how digital, as Simon started today, needs to be at the start rather than something that's sort of bundled on as an afterthought as it used to be. And his view is, this is not just a new chapter we're writing, it's a whole new book. So we have moved a very, very long way away from the more simplistic who, what, how. It's all an awful lot more complicated. So conversational marketing with digital at its core. What on earth does that mean? My, uh, my husband asked me last night what I was doing today. And when I told him um, about this session, he said, so I bet you're going to talk about paradigm shifts. There you go, can't disappoint the man. Um, three paradigm shifts to consider. So one, Matt touched on this first thing. Um, research with digital at its core now genuinely gives us the ability to have real-time immediate insight. To check out, what do people think about my brand? How are they behaving? How are they engaging with it? What do they think of it? Are they responding to any of my, my advertising? And advertising. So I'm going to run through one example, as I touched on earlier, um, of where advertising is increasingly about becoming content. So taking that leap of faith of not necessarily feeling that you're in sole control of your brand anymore, but engaging much, much more closely with the people that are actually speaking about it. And in essence, potentially acting as an extension to your own sales teams, negatively and positively. As a, as a potential. So all around turning advertising into content and moving from push marketing to two-way push and pull marketing. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, for me, is absolutely at the core of what is now being deemed conversational marketing, although I'm sure we'll have another, another name for it in the next quarter. So we start on the research side. Which trends should I be responding to? How much interest is there for my products? Who are my brand's customers? What are my customers interested in? What content do they consume? What do they think of my brand? What about my competitors? Which messages are they most receptive to? Who are my competitors' customers? And what do they think of their brands? So these are all classic questions that go on in many, many marketing and media brainstorms. Lots of these research pieces um, have been around for a very long time. So classically, we would look at a lot of the things listed here to start answering some of those questions and give us the insight that we need to drive the ultimate question of, of how we physically communicate with our customers. <coughs> a 
and you're all very, very familiar with these. So if we look at using digital to help answer some of these questions and give the real-time insight that is absolutely at our fingertips, which trends should I be responding to? So searches for digital switchover, for example, grown absolutely exponentially in 2009 a really, really good gauge of an increasing level of interest in an area that previously was relatively unheard of. And that has very, very much driven by a lot of the additional PR and news around it, as one would expect. How much interest is there for my product? So as a good litmus test, having a look at the number of searches around any of these themes or specific products is always a great way of gauging the potential interest in specific product areas that you're very, very focused on. So in April alone, when there was a huge push around netbook-related PR, there were a million searches <coughs> in one month alone in the UK. A great way, as I say, of gauging potential interest. So we often use search as a barometer for not only looking at what's happened in recent months, but also trying to help predict how customers will continue to behave in the future. Very good um, example of that is swine flu. So looking at the um, search spikes that we've seen dotted all over different geographies globally around swine flu where there have been specific outbreaks. So good, good gauge of exactly what people are thinking and worried about. I'm not going to tell you who this brand is, but it's a great way as well of determining demographics so we know exactly who people are. Equally, as a follow-on from that, it's all very well thinking about the space that you own, your own website. What on earth happens when they leave it, though? So for the OEMs in the room that are pushing people to channel partners, this is one of the many, many critical pieces. Equally for everybody in the room who doesn't fit into that, that category, equally important to try and hone the exact areas that you choose to engage with these people in with the right messages. So a great way of determining where else they went, whether it's price comparison sites, whether it's your competitors, whether it's blogs to read much, much more about your products and services. And surprise, surprise, we have a number of free tools that can help you pinpoint many of the answers to those questions. So do engage with my team and the other teams at Google to work through exactly how these can be used to help pinpoint the answers to many of these questions. And the agencies present in the room are very, very well versed in this, so, so use them as you always would. Equally, all this stuff that's going on. So we heard about Facebook and its usage earlier. I was amazed. I, I am on Facebook, and for somebody my age, um, I find it really irritating. I'd rather my mates or anybody that knows me professionally just picked up the phone or sent me an email. I don't really have time to go somewhere else to get that information, to get whatever they were trying to talk to me about. In absolute contrast, and I see my young team grinning at me. In absolute contrast, um, we had a 16 and a half year old au pair living with us for a month this summer. And my kids go to nursery pretty much full time. So she had the chance during the day to, to do some sightseeing and potter around and get to know London. And thankfully she had the decency to blush at this point. But I got home one day and asked her, so, so what have you been doing all day? And it was one of the sunniest, most beautiful days we have had in London. And she said, um, I've been on Facebook all day. And, um, and then when I wasn't on Facebook, I watched lots of old reruns of Friends. So I think in the time that she lived with us, she probably watched every single rerun imaginable. But all sat in front of our PC in the hot little study that we have at the top of the house. So far, far more natural for her to do that as a 16 and a half year old than somebody like me who would have chosen the sunshine option. But these people inevitably will, will seriously influence how we should engage with them 
as the next generation of potential purchasers. Twitter and LinkedIn are the great examples of professional networks and increasingly engaging content and conversations going on. I find Twitter an incredible phenomenon. We launched um, within my team a Twitter account three months ago um, and already have two and a half thousand followers. And all our content, all our tweets, purely center around the UK tech market in a professional capacity. So it's definitely being used as a great gauge as to what's going on in the market, what are potential and existing customers thinking. But what can we learn from other organizations? So inevitably, I'm sure everybody in the room keeps a very, very close eye on what their competition are up to. Very easy to do with digital. And we're also increasingly asked to look at not just great tech examples, but also examples from other sectors. So where can we pinch best practice? Where are people doing this stuff really, really well? One of the examples that I think Peter will probably talk about next door, um, outside our space, is John Lewis. So John Lewis have moved from a very traditional brand, a very, very traditional retail store-based approach to their marketing activity, and yet now have very, very much sped into 2009 with a new, refreshing, invigorating approach that means their customers are continually engaged with without going overboard. So they have implemented a large um, CRM, CRM system to ensure that any messaging, any level of customer engagement is absolutely accurate accurate and not duplicated. So there are a number of examples outside this sector that we're, um, we're very, very happy to walk you through in more detail. If we look specifically at the turning advertising <coughs> into content piece, this is very much referring, about, referring back to the leap of faith that I referenced earlier. Starting to engage with customers who are already talking about your brand in many, many of the different arenas that we've already touched upon today. Again, those of you that were at the marketing summit we hosted will have heard Sam Taylor from T-Mobile speak about this directly and at length. Um, I think it's an amazing example and a very good one within our sector of very, very well orchestrated conversational marketing. Rest assured, though, organizationally, back to the accountability piece, it was a very risky campaign. It was a very risky approach. And it also involved turning not only the traditional approach to marketing on its head, it turned the traditional briefing process on its head. So their view around the Life is for Sharing campaign, and I would be amazed if, if anybody in this room hasn't been exposed to it in some way, shape, or form. Their approach was, this is all about content, and content that we can use and reuse in lots and lots of different formats, which if you think about it, is very, very different to relatively recently in old school marketing, when you would brief an agency and associated creatives around the TV campaign, the radio campaign, the national press, the trade press, the radio, and so it goes on. So the, the approach they adopted here was actually to enlist the help of their PR agency in determining exactly what the content would look like. And the content was very, very much driven by the very well publicized event that they hosted flash mob at Liverpool Street with everybody doing the dance. You've all seen it, so I'm not going to play it again now. So a very, very different approach and all centering around content that could be reused. So although the upfront production cost of hosting such a phenomenal event is inevitably going to be quite high, the fact that the content is able to be reused in digital outdoor, traditional outdoor, radio, and many other formats means that it's a very, very interesting way of challenging the normal ROI models that we look at. So 
The other big risk I think they took, um, although clearly we encouraged them to at the time, was in driving everything to YouTube. So all the TV activity, when they launched this campaign, um, <coughs> all the, the TV activity was directly pushing people to YouTube. And again, that's a big, big leap of faith because it's saying, okay, I'm going to stop thinking that I need to keep people within my own website, within my own environment. I'm going to try and be a bit more channel agnostic about it and actually engage with them when they're already spending phenomenal, phenomenal amounts of time anyway. There was a Facebook fan site. So again, enlisting the help of pseudo additions to their existing sales team. And their corporate site also pointed directly to the YouTube channel that they launched with us. So a very, very good example of integrating it all together, having a campaign that is very, very content-based. And inevitably, the viral marketing effect of this was phenomenal globally. And in fact, if you go onto YouTube now and have a look at the official T-Mobile channel, you'll see it is still one of the best subscribed to most few channels. And that happened very, very speedily indeed. So I've talked a bit about risk. The other key to this particular campaign, which I think is a, is a good lesson to learn for all of us, was the aspect of flexibility. So their view was, okay, we have this initial event, we'll use the video to roll out our TV campaigns, our digital outdoor campaigns, we'll have shots of it for print and everything else that you will have seen. They, um, sorry, totally forgot what I was going to say now. They took the view though that it was okay to engage customers in this way. It was okay to have them contribute. And with the viral marketing effect, it meant that they actually ended up with a lot of celebrity endorsement. So again, if you have a look at the channel online, you'll see some very random celebrities doing their own version of the T-Mobile dance. There was the option of sticking your own photos on bodies of people doing the, the, the dance itself, which certainly went round uh, our team and wider organisation. So people really got involved. And then there's the internal piece. So every single T-Mobile employee was briefed about this campaign, was encouraged to watch the initial TV launch, was encouraged to talk to all their friends about it, so the viral effect of by engaging employees to a high degree was absolutely phenomenal. And in fact, some of them ended up appearing in the, uh, the dance itself. So it's a risk. One definitely needs to be flexible. But it seems to work. So as I said, there are umpteen other examples, both from, both from this sector and others, that we can share with you in a lot more detail. We have reams of research behind the top-line snippets of insights that I showed you where we carried out our research in the consumer electronics space specifically. And there are a wealth of Google tools that we have at your fingertips to help answer some of those questions in what, as we've seen, is an increasingly challenging environment to be a marketeer or an agency in. So my message would be, Engage with the teams at Google. Engage with your agencies who are very, very well versed in using these tools. And enlist the customer where possible. So we've looked at the changing landscape. I think it'll be even more different by the time my kids are uh, old enough. My 18-month-old can already get onto YouTube on my mobile. She can't even speak. Frightening. We've had a look at what this means for technology marketeers. So digital throughout the entire purchase process for both B2C and B2B is increasingly important and at the core. Learning from others. As I say, we have umpteen examples of other organizations who are doing it well, where we can have a look at sharing best practice. And do engage with us. Um, we are here to help 
steer the way through some pretty complex stuff. So thank you very much for listening. And if there are any questions, shoot now or grab me over coffee.